Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Ivan Oberon's Money Matters. Today is Thursday, October 23rd. So you got you got one more week uh, before you're you need to get ready for Halloween. And uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge Halloween guy. Uh, I enjoy just as much as uh, some other people, I guess. But what I'm more excited about this year is that on Halloween, next Friday, we're going to be heading down to Orange County for the REI Expo. So make sure you come out there and see us. Obviously, if you're listening to the podcast uh, after the time, then catch us at the next one. Uh, there's going to be one in Dallas, uh, then um, on the East Coast, and then it'll it'll come back to uh, Chicago, I believe, after that. So there will be other opportunities. Um, so hope you guys are having a great Thursday, a great week. Uh, last week, we started a two-part series on the truth about insuring your rentals, the crit- critical coverage factors that you need to know. And we're going to go for about another 45 minutes or so tonight, uh, maybe up to an hour, depending on questions and, and uh, uh, how, how, how into it I get. Uh, this is Ivan Obron. Once again, I am a private lender and investor consultant, uh, the exclusive consultant for the American Association of Private Lenders, co-founder of Coast to Coast RIA, and a proud uh, representative of uh, National Real Estate Insurance Group. And last week, uh, just to recap, uh, for those of you who didn't hear that call or weren't on the call and you haven't gone to our website yet at c2cria.com forward slash podcasts to catch part one, here's some of the basic things that we went over. We talked about uh, some of the issues of uh, what happens when your rental goes vacant and uh, how your coverage is affected when that happens and what steps to, to take to protect yourself. We discussed the issue of coinsurance and what that means and how it applies and you know, what you want to know about it. Uh, We discussed the deductible, things from how it's applied to how you can use it as a loss mitigation tool, uh, and especially when it relates to your premiums. We went over liability coverage, uh, basically, you know, what is it? How how much do you need? What's an umbrella policy? And uh, some basics about how that coverage applies. And we discussed the difference between actual cash value and replacement cost settlement provisions. Uh, what those means, which ones are you know, the best in, in, in uh, our opinion or on a case-by-case basis. So definitely, if you, didn't, if you didn't listen to that webinar or you weren't able to tune in, go to cdcrea.com forward slash podcasts and look up uh, last week's Ivan Oberon's Money Matters and check it out. But tonight, we're going to go over some other very important topics to kind of round out this uh, you know, kind of coverage series or two-part series that we're doing for rentals. And of course, some of these things also apply if you're fixing and flipping houses, if you have vacant properties, uh, it's gonna kind of go across all forms. Uh, but especially if you own rentals or if you're looking to get into that uh, passive investment uh, for your business, then these are all gonna be very applicable. So every policy has three basic coverage forms. And those would be basic, broad, and special. And the the main difference between these and, and basically how you want to understand them and, and what you choose is going to depend on your understanding of what these each, each of these are, what your business model is, and your particular tolerance to risk. And it's really going to depend on a case by case basis where you take a specific property or project or location, whether it's a rental that's part of a package or a house that you're, that you're looking to flip and you'll apply the principles of these, um, effectively. So there isn't really, you know, that there could be good, better or best, but really the, the reality is that it depends, you know, some people say, well, isn't special automatically the best coverage. Now that could that could be said that yes, it, it technically includes most things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be the the one that you choose hands down, uh, depending on your situation. So you know, on your on your basic uh, coverage form, you're going to have your your 14 basic perils covered, things like uh, fire, wind, and hail. <clears throat> you know those are those are the most common. Uh, issues. The thing to understand is that in basic and broad form, those are what's considered called named peril 
coverage forms, which means that there's going to be a specific list of coverages or named perils that have to be uh, that, that you have to meet. So that, that basically puts the burden of proof in the event of a loss on you as the insured or the client to prove that that particular loss is going to fit within those parameters, within that list of uh, named perils. And so the, the burden of proof is going to be to say, okay, it's not only on this list of named perils, but it's also not on the list of exclusions because every, every single policy and every coverage form has the same list of basic exclusions. And uh, when you go on to special form coverage, that is what's called or considered a, an all perils policy. Now, does that mean that it's just a, a blanket, every single thing that could possibly happen is going to be covered? No, no. But now the burden of proof is on the insurance company in the, in the event of a loss because it opens up the coverage form to say, you know, all these automatic coverages that are included in a basic and broad form are covered, plus it opens it up for more things to be potentially covered. And the burden of proof on the insurance company now is to make sure that that particular loss is not one of the exclusions, right? So now you have a much broader form of coverage and you'll add, you know, for example, things like weight of ice and snow for those of you who are, um, you know, either have rentals or doing projects in places where it gets cold and where it snows. Uh, things like theft coverage are excluded under basic form. So that's very important when you have a rental or a vacant or, or property under rehab. Um, as an overall rule, things like earthquake and flood and sewer backup uh, and ordinance or law, which we're going to talk about next, are all automatic exclusions under under all these uh, under every policy, regardless of the of the coverage form that you select. And those coverages can be quote unquote bought back through purchasing that coverage separately. So you got to understand that those things are not included in any renter's policy, any, uh, or I should say policy for your rentals or your rehabs or anything like that. Those, those are always going to be part of the standard exclusions, uh, on, on those, uh, policies. Now you can buy back sewer backup, uh, on the, on these policy, you can buy back ordinance or law, which we're going to talk about. But the thing to consider is yes, <clears throat> special form coverage, does include the most potential for um, for things to be covered. But as an overall strategy, especially if you have a larger portfolio, you, know, you might select broad or basic coverage because those coverage forms are going to be a little bit less expensive. And so you're using that as, as kind of a, what I also call a loss mitigation tool because the premium that you pay is also considered a loss. So if you can make little adjustments based on your risk tolerance and based on each individual deal and how those and understanding how those coverage um, coverages apply can help you make the best decisions uh, as far as what those coverage forms are best suited for you. And you can have, you know, basic on one property, you could have broad on another property and special on another property. So we can, we can customize all those things for you on a case by case basis. All right. So moving on, we're going to talk about ordinance or law. This is something that most people, I think, as a general rule overall, have never heard of, uh, don't know what it is or, or how it applies. And I put this on here. Uh, this is this is basically a, a kitchen fire. And uh, uh, it's a partial loss to this property. And just to keep it real simple, what ordinance or law or how it applies is in a situation like this, where only a portion of the home is damaged, you're going to have undamaged portions of the home. So it could be a, a home or it can be you know, a, a duplex that you own and, and one side of the duplex is damaged, but the other side of the duplex is not damaged. That is still considered one structure. So what's going to happen is an inspector is going to come in once the repairs are being done to sign off on those repairs. And what the inspector can do, and in, in many cases, do because some of them are, are real sticklers before they decide to sign off on some of these repairs they're going to say well this undamaged portion of the home or this part of the undamaged portion of the home is not to current code because maybe the house was built in you know 70 or 1980 or 1990 or, or before and these building codes 
change on a regular basis. So they'll say, well, this particular part of the home is not to code. And before I sign off, you need to also repair this portion of the home. And not to get too deep into it, you know, there are, there are three basic coverage points in ordinance or law. And one of those uh, coverages is um, demolition and, of course, repair. So, the, you know, to fix this kitchen or a partial loss, let's, let's just say it's $5,000. But to bring this undamaged portion of the home to code, you know, I mean, that can, that can be as much as the, as the damage, uh, the repair to the, uh, those damages or more in some cases. We've seen cases where the ordinance or law uh, claim was way more than the damages caused by whatever the, the, the situation was, whether it was a fire or water damage or whatever it is. So if you do not have the ordinance or law coverage on that policy, that's leaving you very exposed for significant expenses in some cases. So you want to make sure that you look at your policies, review them, that they have the proper ordinance or law coverage for those issues. All right. <laughs> Number three, mold. All right. So, you know, I, I, I made the mold black because that, that's a big scare now, right? And for the last uh, decade or so, you know, this, this whole issue with mold and black mold and what it is and, and, you know, it's just crazy. And before that was asbestos and lead paint and, you know, all this, all this kind of fear mongering that goes around and, and, um, you know, it, 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 it makes certain, certain industries and certain professions more profitable. I mean, the reality is that there's, in most cases, not anything to to really be worried about. But you got to understand that most insurance policies have a, a, an overall or or um, a absolute pollutant exclusion, and also po- typically excludes mold. Okay, and and when, when we talk about liability, the liability portion of your of your policy and the coverage there, uh, it typically will exclude sickness caused by mold because that's, that's typically what people are going to complain about, right? It's, it's either a, an actual sickness or a perceived sickness, right? Or <laughs> something that doesn't, you know, one of the things I talked about in my last webinar is that it's, it's not always about the reality of the situation in a liability claim. Somebody can claim to be sick. Somebody can claim to have gotten sick. Somebody can claim to have gotten asthma or, or whatever it is. And there's and there's some kind of, of a claim brought against you. You got to understand that most of these things are going to be excluded by most policies. So the, the best thing to do is just be sure to consult with your legal counsel uh, and, and address those things with your lease agreements, with your contracts, et cetera. Now, on the property side, uh, mold is usually not covered fully if it's primary damage. So what I mean by that is that if it's if it's just somehow mold just starts happening and and it gets out of control and it damages the property, that's typically not gonna not gonna be covered. Now, if it's a secondary cause of damage, then that's something that does open your policy up for for uh, for a viable claim and repairs. So what does that mean? A secondary cause of damage uh, can be, and, and just as an example, I had a I had a client that went out of town, and while they were out of town, a pipe developed a a slow leak, so it it created damage, you know, to the ceilings, the walls, uh, uh, created a substantial amount of damage. But because it was over a, a period of time of about two weeks, mold started to develop because they were on vacation. So when they came back and realized the problem, see what it, saw what it was, turn off the water, got everything done. <clears throat> well, the mold spores had had a chance to propagate because it was during the summer. And uh, now because it's technically a secondary cause of the damage, the insurance company took care of those repairs without an issue. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, I can tell you another story. It's, it's kind of, um, it's a good thing that I'm not a litigious person because the, the first house that I moved into, I was, I was renting a house uh, after, after I moved out of my parents' house. I, I went and I rented a house up on the hill uh, in, in, uh, in Camarillo Heights. And, you know, great view, all, the, all these different things. But it was this little house on this property. 
And after a while, you could tell there was there was kind of a must, right? And then it would rain, and I noticed that that there were certain windows uh, or window sills that leaked. And you can see one of the pictures there that that has uh, you know some mold developing there around the window. And then there was a there was a closet next to that window. And weeks later, I went in there, and I had coats and I had leather boots and different things in in that closet. Well, the mold had spread in there. It completely ruined uh, a leather jacket and a set of leather boots because it was just growing in there. You know, unbeknownst to me, it was it was doing that and, and the must and everything. I had to, I had to, I, I did have to go into a different place. And eventually, we ended up moving out of that house for a month uh, while they did a pretty extensive mold remediation in the property they had to tear down walls and, and all kinds of stuff because it, it just the water had seeped into too many places but we never did anything never filed a claim never did anything we just we just had to find alternative accommodations while we were there and of course we were not paying rent uh during that period of time but it can get kind of crazy and it can develop in in the most random places so it's it's important uh once again the key takeaway here is that the best way now you can go out and buy buy mold coverage okay there there's there's coverage out there you can get you can get coverage you know you can insure your legs and you can you can insure people going to the moon and you can insure you know there's there's coverage for alien abduction there's all kinds of crazy things out there so you can get coverage for mold however in most cases it would it would prove to be very cost prohibitive so the best thing to do and what i would suggest is that you address the mold issue via your contracts and lease agreements and with your legal counsel to make sure that you have a line of defense uh, there through your asset protection strategies okay now i want to get into the subject of lease options and subject to deals because there 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 are a lot of real estate investors that uh, are participating in these particular strategies uh, i participated in them for a little while myself uh, particularly the uh, not not uh, lease options but uh, there were there were contract for deeds which is similar to a lease option and people uh, as at least most of the people that I know uh, don't understand, and I don't know any of them that had that carried any insurance on their deals when their names were the ones on the contract. So the the thing to understand and to know is which party is actually protected on these on these contracts on, and on whatever insurance policy exists. Typically, the insurance policy that's going to be in existence in the beginning is going to be that of the particular the, the homeowner, right? Whoever whoever owns that house at the time, and is either letting you purchase it subject to, or letting you do some kind of uh, a lease option transaction where where you bring the buyer and they're the seller and, and you and you put the transaction the deal together. Um, the thing to understand is that always the first named insured is the one who's properly covered, not the additional insured. Okay, you don't want to be an additional insured on somebody else's policy. The proper way to do it is not only to know the fact that, you know, who is the, the first named insured, you want to be the first named insured. And depending on how many policies there are, you want to be the, the policy. You want to be the one to take out the insurance policy and not have multiple insurance policies in place. You know, for example, the the seller of the property who had the homeowner's policy at the meantime, he's basically gonna be out of the loop. Once you sign that contract, you by all intents and purposes are the owner of that property by, that, by virtue of that contract. So in most insurance policy contracts, uh, what they typically say that that this policy or this coverage is in excess of any other insurance. So if you take out an insurance policy and there's another policy in force and there's a claim, now one insurance company is going to say, well, we're in excess of you. And the other insurance company is going to say, well, we're in excess of you. And now you're going to have a difficult time getting anybody to pay for that claim. So, 
be the one who has the insurance policy. You don't need, the homeowner doesn't need to maintain that policy. You take it out on your own. You be the first name insured and then you add them as the additional insured because technically you are now the owner. And that's something that you know most people don't know. They don't do. I've never seen anybody do it. So I want to be out here to educate you. If, you're, if you know people doing that, this strategy, uh, we can set those things put those things together. If you're doing it yourself, let's talk and we'll make sure that you're, that you're properly protected. And the other thing that people worry about, of course, is the do, do on sale clause, right? You know, what if there's a change in insurance and then, you know, the current mortgage is still there and they notice that the insurance changes, maybe the name changes. I can tell you that in my experience and in people that I do business with who have been doing not only these types of deals, but insurance for over 20 years, there's never been a single incident as long as the mortgage continues to be paid, where that due on sale clause was called. So don't worry about it. Be aware of it, but don't worry about it. Just make sure you do things right. <laughs> okay. So apparently I'm forgetting that I, that I made these transitions on these, uh, on these points, right? <laughs> so um, I'm talking through them and, and uh, didn't even need them. All right. <laughs> Workers' compensation. This is this is also a pretty uh, undereducated topic, I think, out there. And uh, you know, I, I created this meme because I thought it was I think it was going to be pretty funny. It says it's the most interesting man in the world for those of you listening to the podcast. And it says I don't always hurt myself, but when I do, I'm working for somebody else. And that's that's one thing that you got to understand that you know a, a lot of you guys out there a lot of people out there are using handymen you know little contractors and things like that to to take care of your rentals to do some of the, your lower end uh projects and and perform maintenance and things of that nature and that and that's fine but what's what's the first thing that you got to do before you hire anybody before you let anybody on your property you first got to verify their liability insurance and their workers' comp insurance. You get certificates of insurance with the proper effective dates, make sure that they're current, and make sure that once you receive that information, that then you also call that particular, uh, either the insurance agent or the insurance company directly to confirm that yes, in fact, that policy is in force. And it's, you know, people people do things sometimes, so it's always, it's always good to, to verify. And so a lot of people think, well, you know, I, I, I pay this guy. He's a 1099 independent contractor. It's no problem. The, the issue that you run into, depending on the state, and you want to check with, with your own laws because the, the, the times are going to be different. But if you use them for a certain number of hours throughout the year, now it says that you would be subject to work, you know, according to the Workers Comp Bureau, that you, it, it could be determined that you are subject to worker comps laws and taxes. And so if that person happens to get injured on your job and you didn't confirm that he had his own insurance, now, whether it's the contractor himself or his employees, now you're going to be subject to those injuries. And in most cases, especially if you're doing this um, you know, on, on your rentals, it's considered a business liability. It's considered a business exposure. So even your personal liability is going to come come in and cover you for these things. You know, sometimes on your personal homeowner's policy, if somebody comes in and uh, does work on your house and, and something were to happen and you didn't verify insurance, a lot of those policies have a, a small provision for, for, you know, they call it uh, incidental employees. So somebody coming to clean your house, you know, a couple of times a month, the, the people that come and mow your lawn, maybe, maybe the guy that cleans your pool, those sorts of things who, who are, are, you know, very, very incidental type of employees. A lot of homeowners insurance policies will carry it, an incidental amount for those things. But again, it's not somebody who's working for you, you know, 15, 20, 30 hours a week either. So you got you to gotta make sure that you verify what those things are. The other thing that I like to point out is that I've heard a lot of the gurus say this and use this. Do not. Oh, hey, Fred. I'm glad, glad you, glad you finally found me. <laughs> we're, we're almost, we're almost done. But uh, you can go back and and uh, listen to the recording. Um, not only, not only is the issue of verifying that they have insurance and and knowing how many hours that they they would they would have to work for you before they technically are considered your employee if they don't have insurance make sure you're protected that way is that a lot of a lot of people that i hear being educated are being educated the wrong way and what i mean by that is 
some people because they developed this relationship and and it's just a handyman and you know they want to keep this 1099 relationship and maybe cut costs and whatever it is you know they'll go out and they'll buy the materials for that person if, if there's going to be some kind of maintenance on on a rental property and and that person is is you know in the area they might go and they, they might buy that thing for that particular contractor or or handyman if they're managing themselves and what you just did is you essentially just made that person your employee because you went out and you bought the materials for them, provided the materials for them so that the, now they're doing work on behalf of you rather than you contracting them for a job. And then they go out, they buy the materials, they do everything else. And so you got you to gotta be very, very careful on that. Um, so that, so that you understand that you, you just, it just doesn't, it doesn't pay to, to try to cut corners when it comes to hiring people who have the right insurance so that it doesn't fall on you and making sure that you, you run your business in that way. Okay. You gotta, you gotta take it seriously. You gotta run things as a business. If you want to make sure that you're successful and you can grow your portfolio and your cash flow and everything else, you gotta do it right because all it takes is one is one mistake. All right. And finally, we're going to go over the point of renter's insurance. And of course, there, there's a couple of reasons uh, that this is important. And first, I want to go over you know, what your tenants need to understand. Because I've, I've done a lot of these. I've, I've insured a lot of rentals for, um, for clients who are essentially the landlords. And I always stress that they want to put in their lease agreements that their tenants need to carry renter's insurance. And in some cases, depending on where these properties have been, the the landlord box and thinks that, well, they're not going to want to go through the expense and they've never carried it before. And you know, I don't want to enforce that because they not, may not want to stay there. And I say, fine, good riddance. Let them, let them go. Renter's insurance is, is so affordable. Every single person should have it. And first, let's, let's go over how, how you would maybe present that to to your tenant because they need to understand that even though you may be requiring it for your own motives and your own reasons, which are very, very good reasons, they have an, a great benefit too because those policies are written for them on their behalf. Every single person, we all have what is called liability. Okay, We all create and generate our own liability and anything can happen, whether it's away from our house or whether it's at our house. You know, your, your personal liability carries you, carries, uh, stays with you and follows you anywhere you go in the world. And a renter's insurance policy gives you personal liability just like a homeowner's insurance policy does. And if you have guests over, somebody gets hurt, somebody slips, whatever happens, you, you accidentally cause damage to somebody else's property or, or cause bodily damage to them, your personal liability is going to be what responds to that. And that is offered to those tenants with a renter's insurance policy. Furthermore, any of their personal property, meaning, you know, their couches, their electronics, TVs, appliances, dishes, clothing, jewelry, all that kind of stuff, all their personal property, which is inside your rental, your property, you have no interest in. You don't care about any of that kind of stuff. So nothing that you have is going to protect those things in the event of a fire or theft or anything else. So it behooves them to also get that coverage up to a limit that they feel is adequate to protect all of their all of their their possessions that are going to be housed within your property. So that's that's the thing that they need to understand that it, it really is to their benefit first, and they have to see it that way. Now we understand that over sixty percent of property claims are caused by negligent negligent tenants. Okay, so. Now we'll get into the into the issue of what's in it for you, right? Because you're concerned about liability. You're concerned about the property. And <clears throat> if they don't have renter's insurance and for some reason they create damage like that kitchen fire I showed you, you know, that's that could, very well could have been a negligent tenant who let something in the kitchen get out, get out of hand, you know, who who leave candles on, who smoke in bed, who who do all these silly things, leave windows open. Uh, you know, they, they do all these silly things and if a claim claim happens and you go to collect a judgment, but there's really nothing to collect a judgment with, you know, they don't have any income, they don't have any reserves, they don't have any assets in many cases, you know, they're, they're either 
career tenants or they're or they're working their 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 way up their career chain, right? And they're in you know their their businesses. You can't collect. So one thing that is covered in that renter's insurance policy that benefits you is negligence. So if 60% of claims are caused by negligent tenants, you want to make sure that there's coverage for you under that so that that provides the first line of defense. And now you have somebody with actual pockets to collect a judgment from. Okay. So that's, that's one of the issues as, uh, as far as that's concerned with where property damage is concerned. Of course, your uh, property policy will also cover damages, but again, you want to go to the renters, the tenants policy first. I want to, as far as liability is concerned, you want to make sure that a tenant carries a minimum limit of liability, whatever you decide it is. I usually recommend five hundred thousand dollars as the minimum, and list you as additional insured on that policy, so you're notified in the event anything anything um, the cancel anything else anything else happens, and again you're doing that as a fir- as a primary line of defense. Because you as the owner, since you're the title owner of that property, if something happens, even though it was the, the negligence or the fault of the tenant, you know, they have a party, somebody gets hurt, there's a pool, somebody gets injured and falls into it, um, you know, somebody has, has a slip and fall uh, because it's getting cold and, and maybe it gets icy in certain certain parts of the country where we insure a lot of properties, Right. All those all those things, even though the tenant brought that liability onto your property because they live there, who are they going to look to? They're going to look to, well, who, who potentially has the biggest pockets? And so any attorney worth of salt. Yeah, sure. They're going to come off after Mr. Tenant who who brought that liability on there. But they're also going to name you uh, as, as a <laughs> on that lawsuit because you are the titled owner and everything always falls back on the titled owner. Now, if the tenant has renter's insurance listing you as additional insured, that claim is first and foremost going to go through and be paid by the renter's insurance policy, saving you from having to file an additional claim or your own claim on your insurance policy yourself. And so you always want to have those, that policy for the first line of defense from a liability standpoint, and also from a negligence standpoint for, for your property damages. And all in all, it's a great, um, benefit to the tenants as well. And, uh, you know, then you'll all have happy tenants moving in, sharing their, sharing their, their sparkling wine over pizza and everybody, everybody will be happy. So that's, that's a takeaway. Make sure that you, when you're going through your asset protection, uh, strategies and you're going over the contracts like we talked about with the mold and workers comp and your lease agreements and everything else that, you know, it's my recommendation that you always make carrying renters insurance a requirement of, of your lease agreements and contracts. And again, it's, it's so minor, um, you know, unless they want to insure a, a whole bunch of property. I mean, I, I've written renter's insurance policies uh, where the people had, they wanted to insure $250,000 worth of pro- with a, worth of property, personal property. And of course those premiums can scale up, but if you have that kind of, you know, that much personal property and fine arts and different things, um, then you can afford it. Okay, so make sure make sure you require that. And that's it, guys. So we we went over tonight, basic form, broad form, special form, uh, the differences, uh, what what to expect with ordinance for law, and what that means, how to deal with mold, uh, how to insure yourself properly with, when you're doing lease options and subject to deals, workers' compensation laws, and how how it can affect you and how you could basically become. Um, you know, called into a claim or become a victim of that if you don't if you don't understand that properly, and then of course the renter's insurance, and that 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 basically wraps up from last week. Most of the things that you want to know and that you need to know when you're having cash flow properties, when you're dealing with with tenants and with rentals and the different things that come up. Uh, obviously, if you if you ever want more information, you can reach me at Ivan at nreinsurance.com. You can check out my page at c2cinsurance.com, find out a little bit more about us, about our differentiators in our insurance program. You can also get a proposal there. You can uh, check out our testimonials. 
And just understand that we, the, the insurance program that we've put together is by real estate investors for real estate investors. We do this in all 50 states. Uh, we, we streamline the process for you and give you the right coverage at the right time. Um, I apologize tonight, guys, for those of you who did show up. Um, as I told Mary in the beginning, GoToWebinar structures these 24 sessions. And after the 24 session, it kind of it kind of just kicks out your webinar and you don't have it anymore. So I had to, I had to create an email all you guys. I'm glad those of you who found me did find me and I look forward to seeing more of you on uh, later on. Uh, I would like to open it up for some questions though, just in case I went a little bit too fast through any of this and uh, you want some clarification on, on any of the things that I went over. Uh, if you want to ask a question live, raise your hand and I will unmute you. I know Mary, Mary had her hand up from the beginning, but uh, I don't think she, she wanted to ask a question. She was just letting me know that uh, she could hear me. So any questions, guys? I know some of you showed up late. Maybe you, you're not sure. Um, I'm going to have this, this webinar posted up by tonight, so it'll be available tomorrow for those of you who want to go back and watch it. And if you have any questions after you watch it uh, or if you're listening to the podcast, feel free to reach out to me, Ivan at nreinsurance.com. Happy to spend some time. Uh, explain those things to you. All right. So if there's no questions, then we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up for the night. Have a great rest of your Thursday evening. Thanks so much again for making the effort to be here tonight. And uh, I'm glad you guys were able to get the registration link again. And we'll catch you next week where we'll be going over some new and exciting information. Take care.